Lynn Cook is Senior Curator, Special Projects in Modern Art at the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. Previously, she was the Chief Curator at the Museo Reina Sofia in Madrid, 2008 to 12, and Curator at the Dia Art Foundation in New York, 1991 to 2008. She has published widely on the work of contemporary and modern artists, including Agnes Martin, Zoe Leonard, James Castle, and Alighiero Boetti. She is currently curating Braided Histories, Modernist Abstraction and Woven Forms, scheduled for fall 2023. Born in Havana, Cuba in 1963, Jorge Pardo studied at the University of Illinois, Chicago, and received his BFA from Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, California. Pardo's work has been the subject of solo exhibitions at the Pinacoteca de Estado Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo, Musée des Augustins, Toulouse, Irish Museum of Modern Art, Dublin, K21 Kunstdammlung Nordheim Westfalen, Dusseldorf, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and Museum of Art and Contemporary Art, North Miami. Paintings by the artist were included in the 57th Venice Viennale. Jorge Pardo currently lives and works in Merida, Mexico. Please give a warm welcome to Lynn Cook and Jorge Pardo. Thank you, Paul. I'd, I'd like to begin by thanking Rena for the invitation and Paul for his um, generous assistance in making my um, arrival and stay here, so welcome. Thank you both. Thank you everybody for being here and uh, it's always nice to be in Miami. <laughs> so. so we thought we'd start by situating the show a little and saying <laughs> something about the groups of works here before turning to broader questions. So the first question, Jorge, did you come up with the title? Um, no. <laughs> no, no. Um, the, I did come up with the title. The title was was uh, was 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 sort of conceived actually in conversation with uh, Rena, and uh, I've always liked the word mongrel because of its a uh, it's it's a uh, it's got a kind of a a humorous and s slightly negative connotation in terms of like the regrouping of something or like or the organ you know when things come together, but. Not necessarily in the in the most uh, in, in the most positive way, but it's also I I like dogs I like street dogs and they're mongrels and and I think all Americans are mongrels to some degree but uh, and I think that uh, this place in particular was was a, was a place that sort of processed people that like like us and like me when I was when I came through Miami and. Uh, I just thought it would, might be interesting and slightly funny way to, to, to sort of express like this uh, problem of, or this problem slash opportunity of assimilating into the United States, so. And, and the show, com well, it's really conceived for this extraordinarily yeah. beautiful space and it comprises three distinct works or bodies of work, uh, the works on paper, this amazing chandelier, and um, the circular rug, plus the chairs. Can you say something about, um, let's start with the, the works on paper. Okay. The works on paper are a little curious because they're, they're works that I begin and, and make on the computer. And uh, so I just, and I use a lot of images and a lot of different references. And, and in this, this particular body of work, I think the, uh, the one consistent set of images that were used were, were histories, uh, images from the archive, the photographs of the archives of, of, the, of uh, the, the Freedom Tower. And uh, so we basically colorized them and then kind of used them and then overlapped them with paintings I, I like. They're 
images I had or things like that. Or, and I also I went back to a lot of images, a lot of paintings, images of paintings of, that for me were sort of formative. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I always, th I always thought like just as I sort of assimilated into, into being an American that I kind of assimilated into being an artist. In a way. And I, I think of those processes as kind of similar in a sense because I didn't really grow up with art. We never went to museums or anything like that. So for me, you know, my sort of formation as an artist sort of is, came from a, a pretty academic mm -hmm. place. And, and I was always very conscious of going from not knowing what an artist was <laughs> to becoming an artist. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I just wanted to sort of just use that notion as a, as a, as, as a kind of a starting point. Another thing I was thinking about when I made these two was that uh, when we left Cuba, th there was, th they used to do this horrible thing, which is that they would take your pictures from you, particularly in the late, in the late 60s, and then they would say, well, well we're, we have to look at them because we want to make sure there's nothing uh, counter-revolutionary in, in here, and we'll send them to you. And what they did, which is really crappy, actually, was they would send them to, other, they would switch the families up. And, and now these families were, would be in other parts of the United States. So like we ended up with somebody, a family's album or, or photographs that ended up in, I don't know, we think in Colorado or something. We were in Chicago. So it was, it was just a way to kind of, kind of really screw with people as, that were leaving. And uh, I thought that's kind of interesting because that's kind of brutal. Maybe there's a way <laughs> to use that, that type of, uh, that, that type of, us a collation to kind of structure these images or something like that. So I was thinking about that too. And and they they combine analog and um, and digital. Yeah, they're they they're made they're kind of made for the screen on the screen and 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 I, I also refer to I, I I'm painting the screen or drawing on the screen at the end of the day, and then they get they get output as a as line work that gets made in the. By a, a laser, and then they just get filled in like a, like a, like a coloring book, really, and then they end up with as what they are. And who fills them in? Um, the, my assistants in the studio, mm -hmm. and then there's a there's a there's a school I work with of uh, that have students, and that they do that, and uh, and sometimes I do them, but not not very often. I, I don't have the the. Uh, the attention span for that. So. <laughs> but I check them, and, I, and sometimes we correct them and things like that. Or sometimes we'll make two or three of them, and it's kind of always interesting because they're all different mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when the colors are like way off or something like that. But, sometimes, but, but, but there's always something interesting in, in uh, knowing that what you're looking at as the image that you're producing, that it gets sent out either be it some sort of, you know, really stupid, simple technical device like a printer, and it comes back, to, in this case, it's like, they're, it's like human printers, but it comes back as something different. And then you start to kind of, after you do enough of these, you start to, if that, that difference becomes a kind of something that you project onto when you're actually making it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of always fun and interesting to play with, with that, you know, the scope of, of the possibilities of that. Because one of the things that strikes me is you go around the room and look at them and start to have looked at five or six or seven, you realize how different from each other they can be. And there's, unlike most shows of a, one artist's work, after a bit you get a sense of, if not the mark, if they're handmade, mm -hmm. uh, the sensibility or, or the the style, so, so the, the sense that they're made by one person is, is um, evident the more you look, but these have an uncanny, to me, um, uh, resistance to um, some, some group inevitably, because they're similar in some way, but others really stand apart. And so, although obviously I know they're all yours, they don't, they don't have that identity yeah. in the same way. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, I, I'm. I think I, I, I'm too dis easily distracted to be able to do that, and I think that it's so in a way like, and there's there's too many differences in this in the source of imagery mm -hmm. 
that's used to produce these that that are constantly being either erased or put on top or or sort of you know xed out. The, these are made in Illustrator and uh, and and Photoshop, but but they're 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 made in a very rustic way. Mm -hmm. Like there's no real filters in any of this stuff. It's it's just layering. And 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 what I'm trying to sort of do is to just use the layering in this in this very sort of almost a gestural way. Mm -hmm. Like you know, some of these images ha might have 20 pictures in them. There might be a there might be a de Kooning or or there might be a there might be an Albert Olin in there. There might be a, an old picture of my family, or there's there's a picture from from the from the archives here, and things just kind of continue to get erased and kind of organized and and sort of composed. And and sometimes I'll just pick a picture because I think that part needs a little more yellow, <laughs> and I'll look for a, a painting with it's got some yellow in that section or something, like that, and I overlap it. Then that works. And then you have to, so, you know, it, it takes it takes about an afternoon or so to really make make them, and and then you just kind of get tired of the process and and you stop. So, so half an hour, I mean half an, half a day, an afternoon, and then you said something like a year to uh, work that that on took the a show, while. That that that's 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 got a lot of a lot of data in it. It's a uh, that has, I think, about, I don't remember what it's like, about four, four or 500 pieces that are all different in either their geometry or the, the, the imagery that's, that's painted on them. So um, that, that gets modeled, and then color gets modeled inside of it with other shapes. So there's like six or seven shapes in there that, that are all intersected. And um, that's the easy part that the computer does, but it's, it's fairly complicated to, uh, to take that digital stuff and then generate an analog reality for making it. Because every layer has to be, each one of those 400 layers has to be sort of redrawn respect, you know, it has to, there's a different color in each layer. It's not like, you know, and uh, so each piece is, is individual in terms of what it requires to be a, a section in the work. So it takes a long time. And uh, so we, we did a lot of proto, we did smaller ones, we did, you know, and yeah, I mean, I, that's, I've been working on that one for about a year. And uh, I don't know if it takes a year, now, it, now, if we were going to do something again like that, it might take less, but, but still it takes, because we have a kind of a system now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's something in this that you don't see, which is that it, it has a, it's got this sort of administrative index built into it. In other words, every part is numbered. Uh -huh. there's, a, there's a left and a right. There's a top and a bottom. And so you kind of, you kind of you need a spreadsheet for that that's, that has each section. And it was funny because when we first installed it here, it got installed upside down, and it still worked, but it was upside down. So we had to take it down and put it back together. And it's like there. Uh, I mean, it's it's as complicated as 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 the, hopefully the uh, the visuality is, of it is to some degree. So. And when one thinks of artist studios going back over you know, a century or so, and the kinds of equipment artists used to have, uh, whether it's uh, making in plaster for bronze casting or for marble, if one goes back to Rhoda, um, it seems like you've got some very high-tech, sophisticated equipment. Is this equipment that... Um, who else would have this equipment, and what would they be doing with it? I think, you know, I think it used to be a lot more high tech mm -hmm. 20, 30 years ago. I mean, I've been working with CNCs and, and uh, you know, rapid prototyping machines and things like that for 30 years. And I think at that time, it was, they were really rarefied because it, uh, they were kind of, uh, economically, they were, they were out of, they're out of reach, mm -hmm. to, like, an artist studio or something like that, you know, like the machine I have now is a $35,000 machine that was probably, you know, half a million dollars in 1995 or something like that. And 
it, uh, but I think a lot of people use them for everything. I think things that are, you know, things that you just take for granted, these are used for. I mean, those chairs are probably CNC'd out and assembled in China. So, I mean, uh, it's not, there's nothing esoteric about the processes, but I think because there's always been, there's always such a, uh, such a deep sense of shame in, 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 in artists in thinking of production and that it always has to come from some sort of either tactile or inel or like, you know, the deep responsibility, whether, you know, it, and, it, and it crosses all, 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 all sort of forms. It's not just, it's not just uh, the more crafty aspect of, of art production, but I mean, you sort of see it in, uh, you see it in the history of, of like conceptual art, for instance, like uh, there's a reason that, you know, conceptual artists tended to fetishize production. And I've always read it as, as a, as, as, a, as, a, as a way to deal with their guilt of not making anything with their hands mm -hmm. because, you know, conceptual art is basically an American product. And uh, Americans are puritanical. <laughs> you know, these, these are people that, you know, it's not a pleasure culture. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, I mean, South Florida is a little different. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's very Latin and Catholic, but, but, but I'm talking, you know, East Coast. And uh, so I think, I think in an ideal world, you should probably never, never, never make content about the difficulty of something's production. Mm -hmm. Because at, at, the end, at the end of the day, that, that just starts this whole sort of sentimental process about, you know, the artist's ability or something like that. And I think I, I'm much, I've always been much more interested in, in like, you know, the discursive aspect of, of what I do than, than the physical aspect of what I do. And, uh, you know, anybody who's properly trained can draw. Anybody who goes to an art school can do things. Mm -hmm. Question is, is that the most interesting way to, to move forward with what you want to do? And for some people it is, for some people it isn't, so. Well, one of the distinctions between craft and design in recent years has, and why, oh, not why, but the, the kind of um, focusing on craft of the last 20 or so years has a lot to do with the hand, in, and it's, it's probably a cliche, but um, the, the desire for the hand made in a world that's increasingly Im immaterial and technologically yeah. oriented and so on. But the design world, of course, is, is always technological. And I I'm, I'm, was thinking about the uh, way in which maker spaces yeah. have started to be set up where um, people can go to use technologies that they don't have themselves, but they can work collaboratively, yeah. and they can make things which are not, they're not mass manufacturing, but they can be making something right. significant, maybe in small numbers for distribution or, but, but it's, it's a new kind of intermediary zone, it yeah. seems to me, and, and some of these maker spaces, like MIT has yeah. one that's high, obviously very cutting edge, but there are some that are connected to specialized schools, so kids learn how to kind of navigate into yeah, areas. Yeah, like I think any, any proper private school now uh, mm -hmm. is going to introduce kids to uh, rapid prototyping machines and things like that, and they're going to teach them how to draw things in 3D and, and some sort of rudimentary software that can where they can sort of, you know, expel these sort of ideas in their head through the computer and through these machines. I mean, I think um, there's, I mean, on the one hand, as, 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 as people touch things less to, pr to produce them, then there's always, there's always the other side of it, which is that people kind of recoil and, 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 and make these kind of like, uh, uh, almost like, weirdly faux intimate sort of venues and platforms like like Etsy mm -hmm. or or Artsy or something like that or that that basically overcompensate for some tragedy in the uh, in the in, in the the inaccessibility of of actually like 
your body being responsible for the object or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, ultimately, it's hopelessly conservative, but I, it, it has a function. I mean, that's people go. That's why people go to. That's why they go to church and things like that. But it's a. Uh, but for me, I've never really. I've always looked at, at these these devices and these the software that we use and the and the machines and things like that. Like a pencil or something like that, or like a like a like a hammer, mm -hmm. or like or like a, a stapler or something. It just happens to be 2021. And if you are somebody who's a little bit ambitious about how to make something, it's probably a good idea to, to see if these things are useful to you. And yeah. and in, you know, and in the in the 90s, there was it, it, there was there are people who use these machines, and 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 but they were mostly. They were, they were making airplanes and submarines and, and nuclear stuff and all that stuff. And the car industry used this stuff very early on, things like that. But uh, no, I mean, it's, it's just, just a tool that just trickled down mm -hmm. into a... Sure. But, I think, uh, but I think you have to be careful how, how you control those machines' ability to subsume what the objects that come from them are. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because the, uh, then they look shaped by the machine rather than by I an idea and a an utilitarian. Yeah, and, and, and there's also another problem when you use a lot, of, a lot of this stuff is that it's probably better if you're really distantiated from it or really in them. But anything in the middle is kind of complicated and not so interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, like, uh, I think... Uh, it's a pain in the ass to have these machines in the studio because they, they take a lot of maintenance. They take people oh. that know how to run them. Mm -hmm. They take a lot of attention. And, uh, but when you have them in the studio, you think with, with, mm -hmm. with the capability of the mm -hmm. thing, which is very different than making a drawing and then sending it to a fabricator or something like that mm -hmm. that then gets put out, you know, like... Uh, I mean, I always say this is, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's kind of vulgar, but it's like if I have, if I have a budget of X and I, and I want something and I, I design it or something I make, I draw it or for an exhibition and then I send it to a fabricator, I get it back once. But if the machine's in the studio, I can make 20 of these for the same amount that I'm gonna spend working with a fabricator. And let's put the money aside. What's important is that they buy you like, you know, time of inquiry into what yes. you're doing, you know? And to innovate along the, yeah. along the, with the process. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So. And, and turning to the rug, I'll come at it from a slightly different angle. Did you say that it came rather late and... Rena wanted a rug, so I gave her a rug. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we need a rug. We needed a rug, actually. Because I think it actually, it, it kind of, it, it frames, the space in a, in a really necessary way, so. Yeah. Yes, and it, it kind of literally. It literally really sort of like, it, it, it makes space for the lamp to act, to do the, what it does in, in, a, in a more mm -hmm. and consequent what, way. Mm -hmm. um, it's also, for me, a way of kind of um, undoing the reference to the white cube gallery, I mean, this, would look like a, a white cube, more yeah. like a standard white cube if there was nothing in the center. And now it's, the scale is altogether shifted, the chairs are there, it's a gathering place. Yeah. It's, it, does, it, it kind of takes it away from the, um, the coldness of yeah. the white cube. I mean, what I like about this space is that it, it's, it's white, mm -hmm. but you still have a sense of it being, being something else before, mm -hmm. to some degree, and I think that's yes. what's sort of charming about this place. Yeah, it's beautiful. You know, and, uh, you know, and, and there's, not, there's not as much pretending of neutrality, let's mm -hmm. say, or something mm -hmm. like that, you know. And why those particular chairs? Do you, have you known them forever? N not really, actually, Rena found those for me, and uh, I was more just interested in color, uh -huh. and these were really kind of, they kind of worked, actually. And we were trying to get, which, we were trying to get other chairs, but we couldn't get them, and then we found these, and they're just, you know, uh, I just wanted something to interact with the lamp. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that was important, so. You, the sister or sibling to this lamp was shown in New York 
in uh, the Petzl Gallery. And, sorry, it was shown um, obviously in different circumstances, but it was way, way lower. Yeah. And um, in a way, one saw it as a lamp, but, but it was very clearly a sculpture. Yeah. Um, here it became, because, here it became a lamp again. Yes, yeah, and a chandelier. And a chandelier. Yeah. yeah and, and a yoghurt's a weird object because it's only about, I think it's about this high off the ground or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, we didn't want to do it any higher because we thought it might kill somebody. But then after we, after we hung it in the show for, for two months, we figured, that's ah, fine. It'll be fine. It won't kill anybody here. So it was... Uh, no, it's perfectly scaled to this room. It looks I mean, that lamp weighs about 1,200 pounds. Uh, yeah. So it's like a half, more than half a ton. So you can't really... I mean, maybe you can tell, but it's, 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 it's kind of ethereal looking, so maybe not, you know. You know. So, yeah, I think, I think the question of, of like the white space, because I always, I mean, I've obviously made a lot of work that, that directly tries to sort of, uh, you know, discuss the problems of that, that were the things that I consider problems anyway, and uh, it's, it's never a question of, of the space itself, it's a question of always of like, what type of imagination does each of these spaces require mm -hmm. for them to become a white cube? <laughs> ah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yes, it's, yes. And that to me is interesting, mm -hmm. in a sense, and uh, so when I sort of make a counterpoint to that, I'm, I'm hoping that, that the memory of what it was and what was needed for that neutrality somehow gets mixed into in some sort of funny way with what I do. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, but you're right, the, 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 the carpet helps and the, and the chairs help a lot, mm. so. In, in that same show in New York, you had a related set of drawings and you had some paintings and a sofa. And I was talking to someone in, when I was at the show, this person who knew your work well, and I actually don't remember who it was, said, oh, Jorge's come back to painting again. And, you know, like paintings at the, at the beginning or the, the fundament to his career. And I was really surprised by that because when I think of your work, and early on there were the um, photography related with the pinhole cameras, yeah. and then there were things that related to sculpture but everyday objects, the show with the stepladder and things, and the lights which relate to design and interior design and sculpture, and then the house. Yeah. So we're talking through the 90s and, and subsequently, uh, which relates to architecture. And I realized when I, not that any work belongs to one category, like you can always think it's a both and situation. It might be, it's a lamp, but it's a sculpture too. It depends on, yeah, it on depends the frame on. and the context. But I ne realized I never think of painting in relation, it's the one area I don't think about. Um, do you think about painting as a central kind of thread in your work? No, no not at all. I think, mm. in fact, it's, it's uh, I think of them as pictures. Uh-huh. You know, and I think of, uh, it's funny because when I, when we did the show at Petzl, I walked around and I said, I, and I asked people, I was asking, I was like, they look like real paintings, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, because of, there's always this sort of sense of doubt about how this interest or non-interest or these, this, this history of these objects can loiter inside of other things mm -hmm. or outside or around other things. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, for me, the ideal, the ideal space for a painting is like a, like a photo bomb or something like that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know, where you get somebody sticks their head in a picture, in a, in a, mm -hmm. in a picture of you doing a selfie or something. <laughs> and by that, I mean that, it, that there's always a resistance to, to its centralization to some degree. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think it's, I don't think that's really very accurate in terms of what's most interesting sometimes. Hmm. But so. if, even when we look at the drawings, um, as drawings, they, to, they kind of resist the conventions of drawing to me because one doesn't think of 
or I don't think of them particularly as well composed or um, organized in a way that I would expect within that rectilinear frame. Um, they don't quite look like details, but nah, yeah. some, some no. do. And, and, and I, think what you're, I think what you're reading is, is this sort of reality that, that sometimes I reshape them as part of what's, what's involved in making them. Mm -hmm. Like, they'll be like a square, and then it's like, yeah, they just look better as a rectangle. <laughs> Let's stretch this, and, you know, because you're on the computer, so you can do that stuff. You can actually, that stuff is really, it's, it's not difficult. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that's, that it's, they're strange because they're all over, but there's enough specificity in them to individualize them, or individuate them yes. to some degree. Yes. And that individuation is sort of indifferent, but at the same time very present. Mm -hmm. Which is, they're funny. They're, you know, they're, and they're, there's enough elaboration in them that, that they, they, can, they convince the, your optical mm -hmm. mechanism enough to, that you gotta look at them a while. Mm -hmm. you know? Whether they're interesting or not, those are, those are, those are questions for, for people who are in the business of uh, you know, evaluation, but mm -hmm. I'm not. <laughs> I'm in the, I'm in, I'm, I'm, I make things, and, I'm, and I make things that are interesting for me to, to look at and consider and relate, but, and also, I mean, one of the reasons I made drawings is because um, I started making paintings with the same method, but with paint and on the board, and I thought, okay, this is, this is a kind of a weird process. I, why don't we try to sort of see how it behaves when I start running it through other mediums. So in other words, uh -huh. let's, try, let's see what they look like when, the, when you use a pencil and paper mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. you know, one of my favorite painting, drawings of all time was uh, that, that, that Richard Serra drawing where he, where he like, writes action verbs. Oh, yes. Because it's so pretentious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, like, it's ridiculously a pretentious, you know, but very subsequent thing, mm. you know? Yeah. So. Well, one of the differences is that the colored pencil on a white paper means the light's coming back. These, these are much more vibrant than the mm -hmm. paintings are. Yeah. Um, so they, they behave differently in that way too. And the, and the paintings make, somehow they make deeper space. Mm. Yeah. Than, than, yeah, they, than, they than like the pencil. And it doesn't even matter, you can make the drawings big and they still won't do Mm -hmm. They still don't provide the density of paint because mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. a different material. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to make a set. I'm going to use. I'm gonna, now I'm going to move to wash <laughs> and see what happens and things like that. You know. Mm -hmm. But I'm very interested in like thinking like, okay, I'm making these pictures and, and these pictures have this process of production that where the output is as interesting as the as as the as the as the, as the uh, comp comp composing them or something mm -hmm. like that. I would like to think about optimizing that, mm -hmm. those two, that relationship, relationship between those two things a lot, as much as I can, I guess. So one of, one of the driving forces is, is setting up problems, or setting up a hypothetical situation. What, what if I did it this way? What yeah. if I... It might be the same picture that's, mm -hmm. that's a painting. Mm -hmm. It might be the same picture that, that it's a, that's a drawing. Mm -hmm. But maybe we'll use it in another, like, another way. Like, for instance, I did a small group that where uh, we underpainted, oh, uh -huh. you know, we, like, because you can, it's really easy to hit the computer and, and you get, like, you get the, the inverse color. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I've always loved the notion of underpainting in, in, in old, old works mm -hmm. where you, mm -hmm. if you want to really get, like, a fleshy flesh, you got the, the you got to put the right greens under mm -hmm. the pinks mm -hmm. and blah, 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 and all that stuff. So we tried it that way. And there's a, there's a group of that. So it's, I'm, I'm also, I'm just thinking, I'm just, I'm also trying to run processes that, that, that I understand, give certain effects and see what happens. Mm -hmm. so. so, so what you, if I understood what you were saying a minute ago, the question of kind of taste and um, connoisseurial evaluation is really not is, is not, you're not bound up with that. That's, no, no, I, that's I part of the reception. I don't know how to have that is the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that uh, when I look at these, they're kind of the same to me. Mm -hmm. 
they just have different problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some of the problems are a little bit more compelling or less compelling, but at the end of the day, it's like, I would, I would have a hard time saying, this is the best one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or this is the, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. I could say it, but I would always find myself stuck inside a cliche, a, a cliche inside my head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, nah, I don't know about that. <laughs> you know, because then I'd find another picture and, the same, and I'd come up with the same idea. Mm -hmm. So there's an instability in, in, in the way I've always read pictures, which led me to, to do other things. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, I'm, I have a lot of time because I have a baby and I'm in New York like 20 days and a lot of time and, and I have a computer and I thought, well, how do I, uh, this, is, this, this is kind of an interesting way to set up a, a studio practice in a way. And this is, where, this is really where these things become from mm -hmm. at the end. Mm -hmm. And how do you sort of inside that make enough problems so that the, A, there's interesting things to look at and B, there's interesting things for me to consider. So. And another word that comes up quite a lot um, talking with you or reading interviews with you is the idea of a fragment. And, and these exemplify it, for me at least. Um, and fragment not as a fragment of a whole, but a fragment in another sense. Can you say something about that? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, um, I mean, I just, I've, I've always been a big fan of Deleuze. <laughs> and the, the, there's the book, uh, what was it? The, uh, Repetition, what is it, uh, difference in repetition, where he basically in, like turns upside down like the categorical, mm -hmm. right? In other words, he says, he says, you know, that, that uh, difference, difference is not what drives the category. Mm -hmm. Difference is the category, <laughs> in a sense that it's like, like we live in a world of, in a field of difference. Mm -hmm. And to, to move through them mm -hmm. in a way that, that that motion of, of movement is what actually makes the object appear to be so real that it can be categorized to some degree. Right, yeah. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And, mm -hmm. and I think about things that way a lot. That it's not really like, I don't have an objective, but the, the best I can do is put myself inside a problem. Mm -hmm. And if that problem is compelling enough, then whatever spits, whatever I output I, I, I can sort of edit into something interesting, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and with, I don't know if that makes sense or not, but. Yeah, yeah. So, now I'm getting that thing in my hair. Um, maybe a little, you know what? It's gonna go in, it's gonna go in a little bit, it's not a big deal. No, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Um, yeah, but a fragment, I, I mean, I think, uh, I like contingencies a lot because mm -hmm. a contingency yes. is sort of connected to the notion of a fragment to some degree. Sure. Yes. But a contingency is something that you that is in waiting to possibly be processed and mm -hmm. what you what's happening mm -hmm. that you may or may not, you know, it's contingent on that. <laughs> you know, it's like I'm, this food might be good at this restaurant today. But that's contingent on whether the, the good chef is there or not. Or the bad, you know what I mean? It's like. And I, I think that that's really an interesting proposition with which to try to structure things that, that you're not certain of. So that's why I use it a lot generally when I, when I think or when I talk about things from time to time, so. I think it's um, this contingency and slippage and fragment um, really are anathema to the way that the um, institutional world works, if I can speak for... Um, speaking in, in that voice, um, that, the, that what um, <laughs> you know, what museums are busy doing, um, even more than the academic world, I think, is ta what I'd call taming and framing. Yeah. Like they're they're finding categories and typologies, and traditionally they would have departments that are medium specific, or they're yeah. you know, defined by forms like sculpture, drawing, and so forth. And, and so you, you find the category, you frame, and then you grab the, you know, the, the mentally take the object and you frame it within the tamed process. Right. And yours don't like being tamed and framed, it seems to me. Like they're very 
slippery in that they would work perfectly well in. Well, I always thought my job was to to make things that were inherently difficult to totalize. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that, I always understood that to be what an open work is mm -hmm. to some degree mm -hmm. and what, what the potential of an open work is, you know, and I think uh, there's a lot of difficulty now in making what's important to me sound coherent because they're, you know, uh, most art has to be narrative mm -hmm. to some degree, mm -hmm. some more specifically than others. Um, I've always been interested in abstraction and, and uh, you know, like people make no sense <laughs> or, you know, like uh, concrete poetry, things like that. I've always, I've always, I've always thought those, those are the really challenging things that one has to deal with when it, it you know, as a form, mm -hmm. as a cultural form, let's say. Mm -hmm. Everything else is okay because you can sort of read it and it's, and it's, and it's, a, it's always going to have its, a, its rational analog and things like that. And it's either going to be funny or not, it's going to be sad or whatever, but, but I'm, I've always been interested in, in thinking of a, of a way to work structurally, mm -hmm. but where you, you still have some sort of palpability that's, that's consequent. Like, like something optical has been made, some sort of opt optical experience mm -hmm. has been made. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that makes sense or not. Um, does that mean that you would um, set in opposition thinking structurally and thinking narratively? Are they, yeah. they're, they're alternative modes. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. uh, they're alternative modes to some degree. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, a, like prose and poetry, things like, you mm -hmm. know, stuff mm -hmm. like that. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, there's a huge interest now in, uh, in uh, representational painting, yeah. for instance, and things like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, like I said earlier, not so long ago, that wouldn't even be considered painting, <laughs> you know, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. <laughs> or 30 years ago, or something like that. Now it's, now it's, it's somehow, it's artness, it's not in quite. In any way, yep. yeah. in any way, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's, and by what I mean by artness is it's like, it's, it's, it's a status as consequent artwork, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and by consequence, I mean, does it reflect how we live now mm -hmm. in any, in any way that's useful to anybody, mm -hmm. you know, is it reflecting how people think, is it reflecting how people live, is it reflecting, you know, and that's why I like to use machines that, like, are used to make your clothes, mm. <laughs> things like mm -hmm. that. Because mm -hmm. I'm betting that there's some sort of refractory condition that I'm going to get from that, you yeah. know? Yeah. So. So there's a kind of, well, one could say a paradigm shift from the thinking structurally to thinking narratively in the last yeah. decade or so. Like, we're constantly um, encouraged to make narratives about things, um, to bring our bring our own perspective into a narrative or to, but um, thinking structurally is to think broadly across categories. So the, the um, technologies that fabricate our garments can be the technologies that also, and, and that those technologies have sets of values and uh, ideals and stand for in different ways, yeah. potential vision of society or where a society might go yeah. in a in a, you know, a positive way for any number of reasons. So it's it's a different kind of model. Yeah, I mean, I I, I detest the idea that you have to explain to somebody what an artwork is. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I and and that's why I'm perfectly fine that somebody gets something from what's on the walls without, with, even if it's just the physiognomy of it, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, and I, you know, if you ask me what I'm doing, I'm, I'm gonna sort of tell you about how I did it or what, what I was thinking about or something like that, but I'm never gonna tell you it's because of this, it's this, and I was trying to achieve that or, you know, I mean, I'm, try, I'm trying to sort of tell this story or something. It's more like, you know, I've kind of found myself in this, in this process, and this process had these problems, and then I was able to do this, I was able to do that. And, 
then it's a question of like, how do you sustain that? Mm -hmm. You know. So. Which leaves it up to the viewer to start making the connections from the things she knows in the world, um, like other things that connect to processes and materials and yeah. um, a lived life. Yeah. Like this lamp, the lamp is made very much like the pictures are made. Mm -hmm. There's like a, there's a, a kind of a, a deep technological interior in its production mm -hmm. that may or may never be, be seen or known or anything like that. But it's, a, it's enough to drive me to make something. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which I'm not sure what it's going to do. <laughs> yes, and it's not clearly about... Um, Positing the technological as an alternative to the handmade, because the or, or portraying or, or setting it up as a as a as a, as a potential for, for portraiture of technology, mm -hmm. which is which is historically something that's been done a lot. Mm -hmm. It goes back even to the art and technology show in in the in, this, in the seventies or Blackmore, mm -hmm. where like technology was going to become, you know, yeah. a new a new potential still life or something like mm -hmm. that for mm -hmm. you know, you know. Mm -hmm. That's something I try to avoid. So maybe this is a good point to um, yeah for you, for you to get out of the sun and, and to see if people you have go forward a bit questions they'd like to ask um, relating to some of what we've talked about, or maybe to questions we haven't or areas that we haven't got around to that. Um, you'd like to bring up for discussion? Use the mic, sir. Excuse me. When you talked about the coloring in process that your assistant students do, mm -hmm. you've selected the colors? I make the colors, and then we have a, basically a room about half the size where we make, there's a wall of color. So basically, we have a palette, and that palette has 800 colors, or sorry, 800 colors that we mix and then they have a picture and, and I have a big TV in the room and I put the picture of the drawing on the TV. But they don't like that, so what they do is they take a picture of the TV on their phone and they paint from their phone, believe it or not. And that's how they're made. So they're coloring in, instead of numbers like I did as a kid. They've got your colors there already on the yeah. image. Yeah, and I'm checking in and, I, and it's like, I might say, at first I was sort of a little bit trepidatious and I would say, this one's, just, I don't know, you guys started too yellow or something like that. <laughs> Maybe go back, but now I just let them run. It's much more interesting because <laughs> I can't control what I'm, what I'm gonna get and I have to actually kind of in, in, engage with the, with the thing that comes out and it's, and it's interesting. I mean, to me, it's interesting, you know? So. Hi, quick question. Since you're always on the technological uh, vanguard, um, what do you think about NFTs? Do you have any idea of uh, maybe going digital in that sense? Or do you have an opinion on the. Um, I don't think NFTs are really, they don't do anything. I, I think that they, uh, the most interesting thing about NFTs at the moment is that they, they, there's, a, there's a mythology about their encryption, which is really supposed to be bulletproof. Of course it's not. But um, I'm interested in that. I'm interested in like, the idea that, like, uh, how do you authenticate something as stupid as a, as, a, as, a, as a shitty picture that you sell to somebody <laughs> on the internet, you know what I mean? That's always interesting. But um, I personally have no interest in, in, uh, in owning an NFT or anything like that, because I wouldn't know what to do with it other than maybe make money, uh, which is okay. But it's like, I think for it to get interesting, there has to be a, a kind of a, a kind of a, an infrastructure for it that we don't know how to live yet, you know, for them to actually have consequence in our lives other than financial, so.
All right. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. much.